instruments and what we expect it to do. Um, and then uh, in, the, in the next talk, Robel can talk about his experiences of, of working on the mission as well. So this is a really nice one to show. It's basically a sketch from 1996, which is, um, you know, a long time ago now. Um, that this is 1996 was very soon after the Hubble Space Telescope was launched and then kind of had its optics fixed uh, in the first servicing mission. So it was already back then, it was very soon after Hubble became operational that astronomers started thinking about the next thing, like how are we, what, you know, where are we going to go after Hubble? Um, these space missions are, you know, are basically very, very long term projects. And so this is kind of really how it begins there. You know, you can see there were kind of scribbles on a napkin and, uh, you know, something and, you know, kind of a sketch of what that telescope should look like. And in the very early stages, uh, the mission was called the Next Generation Space Telescope. Uh, it looked something like this. You can see, you know, you can see some of the kind of main components of, you know, there's a sun shield and there's the mirrors and then there's kind of an instrument module. And then after many years, what we, where we have landed is uh, with this. This is uh, what the, you know, the telescope looks like uh, today. Uh, this is a beautiful artist's impression, uh, but you can see a lot of the components that were in those original sketches, you know, they're all still there and kind of, you know, the design, um, you know, isn't too different really. So we have this very large uh, sun shield, which it consists of five very thin layers of material, which have to be very, uh, carefully kind of unrolled and tensioned when we get into space uh, we, and which shields the telescope from the, the heat and radiation from the sun. We have the big primary mirror which is um, six and a half meters in diameter and consists of 18 hexagonal segments. So this is the first time that you know our, um, uh, that we're launching a space telescope uh, with um, a, hexag um, a segmented primary mirror, just like some of our telescopes on the ground, like SALT, for example, in South Africa. Um, and then, you know, we have a secondary mirror and on the back of the primary mirror sits this module called ISIM, the Integrated Science Instrument Module. And that's where all the science instruments live. So if we compare Webb and Hubble, uh, the, you know, the big difference is just the size. So Hubble had a mirror that measures about two and a half meters in diameter and Webb will be six and a half. Um, so that's a lot more collecting area for photons. Um, Hubble also observed mostly in at visible wavelengths, uh, also a little bit of ultraviolet and a little bit of the near infrared. Whereas Webb is in exclusively looking at infrared wavelengths. And that's really going to help it kind of um, extend those, you know, build on those kind of scientific discoveries of Hubble and, and push them further and push them further. Um, you know, one of the kind of big goals is being able to see the very first generations of galaxies that formed in the early universe. And so we're going to be able to push even further into the history of the universe uh, than we could with Hubble. Another big difference is that um, Hubble is in low Earth orbit, so it kind of whizzing around the Earth um, at a, an altitude of about of a few hundred kilometers, um, and that also meant that it was serviceable. So, as you may know, there have been uh, several uh, servicing missions to Hubble to fix and upgrade it over the years, which has allowed it to be in operation for you know 30 plus years now. Uh, Webb, on the other hand, will be going out to the uh, second Lagrangian point, which is a kind of quasi-stable uh, point about a million and a half kilometers from Earth. Um, and at that kind of distance, it, it means it's not actually serviceable. So that was already you know, a very big difference in how the design and engineering was approached. Uh, Webb will be launched uh, by um, on board an Ariane 5 rocket. So this is one of the major contributions of the European Space Agency uh, because the, you know, the Ariane 5 is the, uh, the launch vehicle for the European space community. Uh, but Webb is so big that uh, you know, there, we have to actually fold it up to fit into the fairing of the rocket. And you can see a little diagram of that there. And we'll have more pictures later as well. Um, and so in that kind of completely folded in configuration, uh, it kind of fits into, you know, into that upper stage um, of, the, of the rocket, which is specifically designed um, to hold it. 
And here's like some nice graphics of the uh, launch sequence. And it's really exciting now that we are actually like on this slide <laughs> right now. Um, so right now we are kind of um, uh, going to the stage of, of where web is going to be integrated uh, with the rockets. That's going to be happening uh, very soon. Uh, so we're still in this kind of assembly and integration phase, but you know that leads us up to launch. Uh, I, I won't go into the details of all this, but it's kind of nice to show you know this absolutely enormous telescope compared to the, you know still looks pretty tiny when you put it in that huge big rocket. Uh, and it's uh, as someone who's worked on it for a long time, it's uh, quite terrifying to see this huge you know thing that we've been working on for such a long time sitting on you know a, a pile of on on this huge rocket which is you know kind of a pile of explosives really <laughs> the really big thing that has to happen after launch is that because the telescope is completely kind of folded up now um it to fit into the rocket is that you know when we're in space it's going to be released and it has to unfold um so this is going to be uh, a kind of a nail biting first month of uh, after launch because uh, there's lots and lots of moving parts uh, in there. Uh, we have this huge sun shield that has to kind of fold open, unroll and you know get tensioned. Uh, the mirror itself has these two wings that are folded back. So they have to be folded out and so that we have one uh, mirror surface. And this huge boom structure that the secondary mirror sits on as well also has to fold down uh, into, um, you know, in, into its position. And that all has to happen before we can even, you know, think about switching on any instruments or testing anything out. So that whole process of unfolding is going to take approximately sort of the first month uh, after launch. Um, and so we're all going to be watching that uh, very, very closely. I mentioned the telescope is going to go and orbit at the second Lagrange point. So this is kind of a, basically in the, the gravitational system between the sun and the earth, you have a number of kind of stable points where things can keep a stable orbit. And so this L2 point is actually, um, so it's, it's if you have the sun and the, the earth in a line, it's basically always kind of behind um, the earth. So it's shielded from a lot of sunlight um, because it's in the shade um, of the Earth. Uh, there have been other space telescopes there. For example, the Gaia Space Telescope is there and Herschel and Planck also operated from there. So this is something that we have done before. Um, the, you know, that's not, not entirely new. Um, but, you know, it'll take, you know, about that whole first month for it to arrive um, at that location and has to be kind of injected into uh, a nice stable orbit there. And then it basically, as the Earth goes around the sun, Webb kind of always trails behind the Earth um, along that orbit. So it's kind of very different uh, from have things like the Hubble Space Telescope that just kind of go around the Earth in low Earth orbit. And once we arrive there, then the um, gradually all the functionalities and the instruments of the telescope will be turned on. And then there'll be a period of testing lasting about six months um, you know, where we check everything out, make sure everything is working um, and, you know, derive some kind of new calibration files and things like that uh, to get the observatory kind of ready to do science. So, so telescopes need instruments. So the size of the telescope, which we've talked about, is very important. But the telescope, in a sense, is just kind of a big light bucket. It collects photons, collects light and then sends it off somewhere to an instrument. The bigger the mirror is of the telescope, um, the bigger kind of your light bucket is. And so um, so you can uh, detect fainter objects, but you can also, with the, the larger the primary mirror is, the, the better the resolution is that you can achieve. So, um, and that means it's basically, you can, you can see finer detail in the images. So having a bigger mirror is definitely gives you a lot more power. Um, but the real kind of science is done by the instruments. And Webb has four science instruments on board um, for that, offering a huge range of capabilities. Uh, so you can see pictures of them here. Um, they look pretty complicated, but you know, as far as astronomy instruments go, you know, because they're in space, they're actually very compact. 
So if, if you've uh, ever been able to visit a telescope on the ground, you know, you probably you may have seen that some of these instruments, you know, can be huge. They're like, you know, the size of a small room almost. Um, whereas these, you know, they all kind of fit on a tabletop, really. But between them, they have a huge range of different modes, like every instrument has different types of cameras and spectrometers on board. Um, so to really be able to do a very wide range of science. So I'm just going to give a kind of uh, a quick overview of all of them without going into too much detail. NERCAM is the first one, is kind of, is um, really the workhorse imaging camera for the observatory. Um, it's, ki it's kind of amazing because it is, it's fully redundant. So it actually has um, two identical halves to it, which can be used together. Um, but the reason for that is that NERCAM is used to align the primary mirror. So when the, the mirror kind of uh, all folds into place, all the different segments have to be finely aligned to create the best image quality. Uh, and for that, we need a camera because we need to be able to monitor what, you know, um, how that's going. And so NERCAM uh, provides that functionality. But it means, you know, if NERCAM, if there was something wrong with NERCAM, then, you know, we couldn't align the primary mirror. That would, of course, be, you know, really uh, cat catastrophic for the mission. And so for that reason, NERCAM has two identical halves so that it is fully redundant. Uh, to always be able to perform um, that function. And that's really something that in the engineering of the mission uh, you see throughout. So there is a huge amount of redundancy built in, in you know, everything down to all the electrical circuitry, uh, just to make sure we have backup systems for everything. It's also, you know, scientifically, it's going to be an incredibly powerful camera that's going to take absolutely stunning images of, you know, some of these most uh, distant galaxies in the universe. NERSPEC is uh, one of the European instruments, and that is, you know, when NERCAM was the workhorse imaging camera, NERSPEC is the workhorse spectrometer. It has uh, some really innovative technology on board. Um, main, the, one of its main functionalities is uh, that it has um, a multi-object spectrometer, so it has a kind of, mic it's called the micro shutter array, so it has a kind of um, a grid of little shutters. And so if you have a field that has contains lots of galaxies, you can just kind of open the shutters at the locations of the galaxies so that you can get spectra of hundreds of objects uh, in one go. But it has it ha also has an integral field spectrometer. So B is able to do 3D spectroscopy um, and a number of different um, uh, spectroscopic modes. It's also going to be one of the main uh, instruments doing uh, exoplanet spectroscopy, so characterizing atmospheres of exoplanets, which is a you know a hugely exciting area. MIRI is the instrument that I work on. Uh, I've worked on it for about 13 years now, so a long time. Um, it is the instrument that covers all of the mid-infrared wavelengths. So longer wavelengths than uh, the other three instruments. And it has also has a, uh, an imaging camera on board, um, various spectroscopic modes, as well as coronography. So which um, allows us to, when we have an image blocking out the light from a central star to be able to visualize what's going on around that star. If it has a disk around it or exoplanets or things like that. Um, MIRI is, uh, you know, kind of, on its own in the mid infrared, so it provides uh, a lot of different functions. And it's also the only part of the observatory that is uh, actively cooled with a cryostat to much colder temperatures than the rest of the observatory. Um, MIRI is, a, is a part European, so um, it kind of was built by a European consortium in partnership with uh, NASA JPL and the University of Arizona. So we have a, a really big team, a really big consortium uh, for MIRI. And then finally, the fourth instrument is the uh, Fine Guidance Sensor and NIRIS, which stands for the uh, Near Infrared Imager and Slitless Spectrograph. Um, so this is the Canadian portion of the observatory. So this instrument was entirely uh, built and delivered by Canada. Um, and so it provides some uh, scientific capabilities, particularly also in exoplanets. Uh, it's going to do a lot of great science. And the fine guidance sensor is what helps the telescope track objects. So it makes sure that when we, you know, when we point at an object and have a really long observation, that the telescope keeps pointing exactly at it and keeps it 
keeps it centered. So those are the four science instruments. And between them, with all of those different uh, kind of capabilities and different, type, different types of cameras and spectrometers, we're really going to be able to do science um, from our own backyards in the solar system uh, all the way through to you know, the, the very early universe. And so there's four main big scientific themes. Um, you can see here kind of that cover basically between them the entire uh, history of the universe. So in the early universe, the questions, we really want to learn more about the reionization of the universe. So this is really kind of where the first sources of light formed. Um, so with the Hubble Space Telescope, we've been able to probe back to some of the not quite the first generations of galaxies, but sort of um, the, you know, maybe like second or so. Um, and so with Webb, we could, we really want to be able to push further into the infrared uh, to really see what the very first generation of galaxies uh, looked like that were responsible for, you know, they emitted lots of ultraviolet radiation that ionized the neutral material and then gradually uh, basically kind of uh, Reionize the universe uh, into the, the kind of state that we we have around us today, um, and for that we really needed that extra infrared coverage. So uh, because of the expansion of the universe, that starlight from those very early galaxies gets stretched at, to infrared wavelengths, um, and so uh, with Webb we have exactly that wavelength coverage to be able to see those. So this is an era of the universe that we really don't know very much about yet. Um, we have lots of models, but with web, we'll be able to really uh, get some real data from that. Um, galaxy evolution is a field that uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope kind of, uh, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope kind of almost uh, created or at least gave a huge push to. Um, it allowed us to see just how many galaxies there are and the, the huge range of shapes and sizes um, and you know how they're distributed in space, and that's something that we've learned a huge amount about with um, both Hubble and also all of our observatories on the ground. Um, Webb is going to be able to continue that um, and look in more detail at all those galaxies throughout the history of the universe, the ones near to us, uh, all the way through to the very early ones. Uh, it'll be able to see like the, the the smallest ones that are out of reach of our current telescopes you know, the weird ones, uh, the faint ones, um, learn more about, you know, galaxy mergers, about the interplay between galaxies and their black holes, um, and uh, lots of important questions like that. Then we're closer to home, uh, we'll be able to study how uh, stars and planets form, um, sort of really be able to see more detail about um, how these clouds of gas and dust collapse to form stars. This is again, something we've learned a lot about, uh, also, for example, with the ALMA radio observatory uh, in recent years. Um, but again, that infrared uh, wavelength coverage of Webb allows us to kind of really probe down into uh, the inner cores of these kind of dusty clouds to learn more about that process. And then exoplanets and the origin of life. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these questions, um, but as you probably know, this is a hugely dynamic uh, area of research. Um, we now know of the existence of thousands of planets uh, in, our, uh, in our own galaxy around other stars. And so I think we've kind of really learned that, um, you know, we're not, our solar system isn't, isn't some outlier, isn't weird in a way. It's just that planets are actually a kind of almost a natural byproduct of, star, of the process of star formation. But a lot of the planetary systems that we see um, around other stars look nothing like the solar system. So they have planets, you know, where we thought that they shouldn't be able to exist or planets with properties that we have no idea how they got there. Um, so, you know, this is an area where Webb's also going to be able to make a lot of contributions. A lot of the spectroscopic modes will be really well suited to um, studying the atmospheres around these planets. So I think it's going to give us lots of new information about what, what these planetary systems look like and, you know, where, where we may potentially have um, conditions that are suitable for life. So that's also going to be uh, a really big uh, topic. Um, there's a, a lot of 
a lot of energy and thought has gone into trying to make web as accessible as possible to everyone. So anyone around the world is able to um, put in proposals to use the telescope. So these calls for proposals are issued uh, once a year. Um, for the first year of operations, we already have a packed program of, um, of uh, observations and these are uh, publicly accessible. I meant to put some more links on here, um, a kind of, um, uh, but I'm happy to share them with, with the organizers so that they can, uh, they can share it with, with the community. Um, so, so we already know a lot of the observations that will be executed in the first year of operations. And there are a lot of programs that will release data into the archive with zero proprietary period. So standard is, um, uh, is 12 months. So after 12 months, data become public in any case. But there are quite a few programs that will produce data that become public immediately. Um, STSCI hosts a big uh, archive that contains uh, the Hubble Space Telescope data and data from uh, several other missions as well. And they have a really powerful platform. So this is also where data from web is going to be released to. And so uh, anyone has access to that. Um, you, do not, you don't need to be in the US. Uh, or anywhere specific that is fully publicly available. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, I can share some links, but basically all the programs that will be executed in the first year, um, some of them are going to be producing data immediately that you can go in and, uh, and look and work with. Whether to do science or whether to just kind of learn how, what the data look like and learn how to use a calibration pipeline and things like that. So to finish off, I wanted to share just some pictures of uh, that have been released in the last few weeks uh, of the kind of the, the, the final stages to launch. Um, I have, for me, the telescope arriving uh, in French Guyana at the launch site uh, has made it suddenly very real. Uh, and I really enjoyed um, seeing uh, all of these pictures. So um, the final uh, assembly and testing of the observatory in the United States uh, was at the site of the prime uh, contractor Northrop Grumman in California. So the observatory was there for a few years uh, undergoing final testing. Uh, and so then from California, they had to get uh, to uh, French Guyana, which is on the kind of uh, northeastern coast of South America. And so uh, the observatory is too big to go on a plane. So it was, it went on this big ship. Um, and here that this is a really nice picture of the ship arriving at French Guyana and uh, going into the port. And so that, that happened in early October. And then there was some kind of unpacking and some uh, final kind of testing, making sure that it had, um, you know, gone through the journey without any issues. This is a very recent picture, I think from a couple of days ago. So uh, after all the testing, basically the observatory was fueled. Um, it has, you know, it has a, a, a full tank of fuel on board, basically that will allow it to make some corrections to its course and make sure that it can um, adjust its orbit to, you know, to, so that it can stay in a stable orbit when it's in space. So you can see it's now completely in this folded up configuration. Um, it took, 10 days to actually uh, fill up the tank with fuel. So compare that to how long it takes to fill up your car. Uh, that was quite a long time. And uh, these fuels that we use in space are very toxic. So that's why the engineers and technicians here are wearing this kind of very um, protective clothing. So, uh, so fueling was complete. I think that was yesterday or the day before, um, which now then allows them to, um, Kind of bring in the rocket basically. Uh, so this is a picture of the rocket that's being moved to the final assembly hall. And so this is where uh, Webb gets kind of put on top of the of the giant pile of explosives um, into the fairing, which was all kind of like really custom built for Webb. Um, so that they should all it all should fit very safely all together uh, for launch. Uh, so that's going to be happening in over the next week or so. Meanwhile, um, back in Baltimore, so this is a picture of the Operations Center, uh, which is at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. This is only one room. Uh, this is the kind of the flight, the flight control room. Um, we have 
uh, three, four, five more rooms like this, as well as like some meeting rooms, all in like a dedicated part of the building. Uh, and so every part of the observatory, like every instrument, every subsystem has kind of its own desk and uh, with a set of monitors that show all the different kind of diagnostics that we need for that particular part. So, you know, for my part, I work on the MIRI instrument. So we have we have two sets of consoles uh, that show us everything that we need to know about MIRI. And so in the past year, a lot of the work uh, that we've been doing is actually just um, working together in the mock and doing practice runs uh, for particular parts of the uh, that early commissioning period. Um, so really practicing like how we talk to each other, how we communicate, and, like how, um, you know, making sure that at every step of the way, every new thing that we want to do with the observatory, that um, we know who needs to give the go ahead for that. Uh, we know how to respond to questions. Um, and that everyone is kind of fully tuned in to the processes and knows what happens. Uh, also, if there are problems, so we've actually had, you know, we have rehearsals where uh, someone does, someone throws in an error or something, but you don't know that in advance where that error is going to be or what it's going to be. And then sort of that we have to then basically practice and like responding to uh, to that unexpected error, just to make sure that, you know, if that happens after launch, when we're in commissioning, that no one has to panic. Everyone knows what's happening. You know exactly who to call and who to talk to and uh, and what happens next. So it's been a really cool part of um, of the project, like going through all this kind of practicing and rehearsals and making sure that, um, you know, we know exactly what's going to be happening after launch. So that's where we are. I hope that was um, a nice uh, introduction to you all for uh, about the web mission and kind of what's been happening. Um, it's a really exciting time for us. It's been a very long road. Um, so it's going to be a very interesting uh, holiday period that we're going into. Um, I just wanted to uh, finish off with, um, I, you know, there may be some students or researchers or other um, people who work in astronomy listening. And so uh, in case people are interested, so the Space Telescope Science Institute is, uh, is a great place to work and it's going to be a very exciting um, place to be for, for web in the next few years. So they have about 800 employees uh, and that is there's scientists and astronomy researchers, postdocs and research fellows like you would have in a university department, but also a huge engineering department and a big group uh, of science communication professionals. Um, and so a lot of their positions are open to foreign nationals. Um, and there are also, um, you know, plenty of jobs that don't require PhDs, that bachelor's and master's degrees, and that are open to like early career people as well. Um, I also wanted to advertise the Space Astronomy Summer Program, or SASP, is uh, an annual summer internship program at STSCI that's open to people from around the world. And there's actually lots of, you meet a lot of professional astronomers who actually started their career um, with the kind of summer internship program. It's a really fun program um, and that gives you, that has lots of great opportunities. So it's aimed at um, an upper level undergraduate students in physics or astronomy, but also engineering or science communication. And um, it provides travel and a stipend and accommodation in Baltimore for about 10, I think it runs for 10 weeks in the summer. And you can, and while you're an intern, you can uh, work in, astrophysics, engineering or software, but also, um, you know, building instruments or also in like science communication and public outreach. Um, the applications for the internship program open in, in January each year. And I've put here the URL, if anyone's interested, um, you can also always reach out to me and I can put you in touch with people about that. Uh, that's it for me. I'm happy to take questions or we can um, go on to Rebel. And then, thank you so uh, much. How do you want to do it, Carolina? Uh, I think this is fantastic. I think we will move on to the second talk right away, and then we'll take all the questions at the end. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was fascinating. And uh, Robel, the the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is uh, Robel. I'm a grad student at Princeton. And today, um, uh, my talk is geared towards uh, non astronomers and maybe undergrads. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about why I'm excited for JWST 
but before I do that, let me just give a short introduction about my career path. Uh, so I grew up in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Um, I moved to the US in 2008. Uh, I did my undergrad at Rutgers University um, and I majored in astronomy and computer science. Um, I was on the JWST enrollment teams at uh, STSCI as a software engineer and as an instrument analyst. Um, I worked on instrument uh, simulators, uh, data analysis tools, and the JWST pipeline. So it was a very exciting time for me. Um, I'm currently pursuing a PhD in astrophysics. I'm interested in galaxy formation and galaxy evolution. Um, and if you have any questions about my career path, I would be more than happy to answer them uh, during the question section or in private correspondence. Um, okay, so with that being said, um, so why, why is it, uh, JWST exciting? Well, there's really two reasons for me. Um, and the first one is the obvious reason, which is that JWST can answer a lot of science questions. And as Sarah uh, uh, told us, it, it kind of spans in different subfields in astronomy. So a lot of people in different subfields are very, very excited. Uh, and we don't really have time to talk about each one in detail, so um, I'm, I'm biased since I'm a galaxy person, so I'm interested in the questions about the early universe. I think that it will answer or show us very profound things about the early universe. Um, and the other thing that makes me excited about this mission is actually how accessible the data and the analysis tools are to the public. So the data will be made public and you can actually download the data at some point. And the tools that you need to analyze uh, the data are also public and open source, and you can get them for free. Um, okay, so first let's talk about the early universe and JWST. Um, so there are two important facts about nature that we should talk about, which makes JWST really suited for this uh, task. So the first fact of nature is something that astronomers always have to deal with, which is the further out you look in space, the further back in time you see. And what do I mean by that? So think about a uh, lightning strike, right? So when lightning strikes, you almost instantly see the lightning flash, right? But then it takes a couple of, or a second or two for the sound to reach your ears and for you to hear that sound. And we don't usually think about it this way, but the sound that we're hearing is of an event that happened in the past, right? So uh, we're kind of listening to something that happened in the past and we know that as a fact. The same thing applies in astronomy, but in this case, instead of sound waves, the light actually takes a very long time to reach our instruments. So if you take the Andromeda galaxy, for example, um, its light takes 2.5 million years to reach us. And that's where the light year comes from, right? Like the distance indicator. And so the image of the Andromeda galaxy we see, if we went out tonight and saw it, um, is of an image of how the Andromeda galaxy was 2.5 million years in the past. So uh, the idea here is the further out you see, the further back in time you're actually observing that object, right? So the idea is that if you see far away enough, you would actually be able to see the first galaxies and even stars uh, that formed. So you'll be able to see the universe forming these things. Um, and that's kind of really profound. And um, JWST actually has the instrumentation, the sensitivity, the magnifying power to actually take us very far back in time uh, and in space, right? Um, so much so that it will be able to see um, about 200 million uh, years after the Big Bang. And that's kind of, uh, <laughs> that's kind of profound because uh, if to put this into perspective, we think that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Uh, and if you think of the universe as a person who's like 138 years old, right, an elder person who's 138 years old, we would be taking a picture of that person. We would be looking at a picture of that person when they were roughly two years old, so a toddler, right? So this is really exciting to me. We would be able, even, even not just as a scientist, but as a person to see the baby pictures of galaxies is really profound and I'm very excited. Uh, and when I say it's a really great time to be alive, I, I truly mean it in this sense. <laughs> so I'm very excited to see what JWST will show us and we'll be able to make measurements and uh, study those galaxies and test our models of galaxy formation. Um, okay, so the other fact, uh, so JWST in particular is important because of uh, what Sarah mentioned, which is that the universe is expanding, right? So as um, light comes towards the Earth, um, 
it gets stretched and this is because uh, of the universe expansion and this is a diagram that um, Edwin Hubble uh, made uh, in the 1920s um, basically he found out that galaxies are flying away from us as a consequence of the universe expanding and when we say the universe is expanding we don't mean that the material in, uh, inside of the universe is moving into some void or something like that we mean that each point in space um, is, is so if you take two points in space they're kind of getting separated um, as time goes on so you can think of it as space kind of stretching um, and this has a consequence so why are we even talking about this right this has a consequence on light waves so light is basically electromagnetic waves um, and as the universe expands the wavelength is, it also expands the wavelengths of a photon right like of a light wave uh, so if a light started was emitted in the blue um, and if it spent enough time traveling in space it would get stretched out to redder and redder wavelengths and uh, I found this cool uh, visualization so if you take a rubber band and draw a wave on it and you stretch it you basically increase its wavelength so that's the basic idea so the issue here is if we're looking at a galaxy that's nearby this is not so much of a, a problem but if a galaxy is further away we start seeing it getting redder and in, in, in you know the wavelengths that we care about and if it's far away enough it would be so red shifted right it would be the the photons would be so stretched out that it would be inside of the uh, infrared regime so if we're talking about looking at the early universe right where galaxies are starting to form the light from them are is actually very red shifted so you know Hubble used this a mirror that you know uh, to, for its magnification and this mirror is basically the same idea as a mirror in our, our bedrooms that we use it's very nice to reflect uh, visible light um, but when it comes to infrared light we need a better instrument and that's where JWST comes in and uh, I'm sure you've heard and, uh, that this is actually all made out of, uh, um, well, the mirror is coated with gold. And the first time I, I, I found out, I was surprised. That I thought that that was a lot of gold, but it's actually a very thin layer of gold. And I heard someone say uh, that if you scraped off all the gold, uh, it would be the size of a golf ball or something like that. So um, that's, uh, but anyways, it's very, it's very useful for reflecting infrared radiation. And that's why JWST is suited for this type of uh, observation. And this is a, a figure I found on uh, Nature, uh, on an article on Nature, uh, basically shows you the wavelength range of Hubble here um, and what JWST's uh, different uh, instruments will see. Um, and this is a, a, a simulated galaxy. So the top two panels shows you what the galaxy would look like in Hubble and the bottom two panels shows you what uh, Webb will, will show us. And so this is super exciting because we'll be able to see these early galaxies and do measurements on them, study them, and they will inform our models. So everyone, including theorists, are uh, excited or anxious, uh, depending on who you ask. <laughs> so um, truly an exciting time uh, scientifically. Um, Okay, so we covered why uh, JWST, I mean, uh, why it's exciting in terms of the early universe. So let's talk a bit about the um, um, analysis tools and data. So let me just give you a quick overview of this. Um, and I will actually go on a web browser and show you how to access things. So um, astronomy is kind of moving towards Python based tools. Um, and if you're an early career astronomer or uh, undergrad, if you take away anything from my talk, the biggest thing I could say is that, um, you know, do whatever it takes to learn Python because it will take you very far. Um, I, I mean, this is becoming more and more important to the point that I would even say that a lot of observational astronomy um, is, is moving to Python and at some point it will, it will be a very critical um, skill set to have. Um, so if you're, uh, there's a lot of um, videos to show you how to do this. There's also PDFs you can download online. There's a lot of resources and examples that you could use to learn how to uh, program using Python. And it, I think that it's the most important skill set that you can learn in this day and time. Um, and I'm seeing the wave happen. So I really, really recommend it. Uh, so with that being said, um, the, the other thing I want to talk about today is the AstroPy project. 
The AstroPi project is an uh, is an of, um, a community effort to provide open source free astronomy software that's Python based. So any type of analysis you you have to do, you don't have to program it yourself. Uh, there's this community based um, software library that you can just uh, import. Uh, you can think of it as like the IDL libraries that you use. Um, and the other thing is that uh, the JWST pipeline and data analysis tools are also public on GitHub and you can download them and use them for free. Um, and I'll, I will talk about that in a second. So with that being said, um, so let me just pull up a web browser and show you. So early career, um, uh, you can just uh, Python. it will take you to the um, uh, python.org. And this is what Python looks like, Python code looks like. You can hit downloads and you can download Python for free. You may need to set up your environment and there are many videos that will guide you through this. So this is a good starting point to start um, and finding a good video or a good PDF that is, is helpful. Okay, so the other thing that I wanna show you is AstroPy. So um, if you just literally go to AstroPy, it will take you to the website. Um, um, it will give you instructions on how to download it, um, you know, a bunch of background information if you need it. Um, and it can, if, you, if you're not interested in the background information, it's as simple as saying pip install AstroPy in your command prompt, and it will install AstroPy for you. Uh, in rela uh, related to this, um, there's also uh, an effort, a separate website called Learn AstroPy. Um, so this is a website with a bunch of tutorials on how to use um, uh, AstroPy. So if you if you want to do unit conversion, uh, you know, um, cosmology, convolution, any of those things, you can actually use this. And it goes through. It has text. It goes through examples, um, and so you can follow this as a guide to learn how to use this uh, this library. So it's very powerful. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, okay. So with that being said, for our um, advanced users, actually uh, part of my work at SCSCI was building the data analysis tools and visualization tools. And um, the fastest way I get to it is I say JWST data toolbox. And I go to the SDSCI website here, which has a list of all of these tool sets. Um, so uh, it's so it breaks it down into two steps. So there is the pipeline uh, step, and the, a pipeline is basically um, a, a sequence of procedures that you perform on your data to clean the noise, to kind of calibrate your your uh, data depending on what you're looking at. So the idea is you put your raw data on one side, and you get um, a data product on the other, something you can actually analyze and data, do da um, your science with. Um, you usually don't have to do this because uh, the PI, you know, presume, I presume that the PI would have already done this, but uh, it's also available for free if you, if you want to um, do this, and there's a lot of information on that. Um, Sarah mentioned MAST, and MAST is actually the data archive, so we talked about being able to access data for free. Um, this is the archive that actually hosts all of this uh, information, so um, JWST data will be uploaded here when it becomes available, um, and if I go to the um, to the main page, you'll see that right now you can actually go to this website and query um, Hubble images or Hubble data um, um, and download them. Um, so that's MAST. So that's the pipeline and data products uh, tools that you can use. But once you downloaded your data, you need tools to actually open up the data because it's in formats that's, you know, uh, a format called FITS or a fancy one called ASDAV. Uh, so you, you need tools to actually open it up and interact with the data. That's where the post pipeline data analysis tools come in. Um, and if we go to the first link, it will give us a list. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, look at the data analysis tools. So in terms of code, uh, the first thing that's listed is AstroPy, and we briefly talked about that. Um, there's also FOUTILS. So FOUTILS, the idea behind it is that you can use this tool to do photometry. Um, um, if you have an image, um, whether it be in galaxies or stars, uh, the other one is Specutils. This is a tool for um, analyzing spectroscopic data. Um, and the other one I want to highlight is JDA-VIS. So this is a, a tool set 
uh, for visualizing JWST data. So it's interactive, it has a GUI, and I'll show you in a second. But there's three modes that it can have. Uh, the first one is uh, SpecVis. And when you're using SpecVis, it's, uh, you're visualizing 1D spectra. Um, and then there is CubeVis, which is uh, for visualizing um, uh, uh, 3D spectroscopic data. So uh, data from the IFU. Um, and then MOSFIS. So MOSFIS is for uh, near spec. And I'll, I'll, I'll quickly actually go to the documentation. If you click here, it'll take you to the documentation for each um, you know, tool set. And it gives you a table of each instrument on this side, uh, what mode that instrument is on, and a recommendation of which uh, mode to use the visualization or which visualization tool to use, to be honest. OK, so the first one is uh, SpecVis, and we can kind of see a, a screenshot of it. So uh, it can display your spectra. Uh, it can do continuum fitting and subtraction. You can fit your uh, emission lines here. Um, so it, it's a very powerful tool, especially if you don't want to do a lot of coding. This is a, a really useful tool to have. Um, and then uh, there is uh, and I um, here we have uh, a, a data cube, and data cube is basically just a, a stack of images uh, that go in different wavelengths. So you can you have a slider to slide through your wavelength range up here, and it will display what the image looks like at that uh, wavelength. And it also shows you the spectrum um, um, of that cube at the bottom here. Um, Okay, so the other one is MOSFIS. MOSFIS is a bit more complicated and it's still in the works now. Uh, let's see, okay, there we go. So MOSFIS is for the um, for data coming from NearSpec. Uh, NearSpec has the ability, or the NearSpec MSA has the ability to take spectra of multiple targets simultaneously or at the same time. Um, so uh, you, wanna, you want a tool to kind of look at uh, you know, multiple targets and see what's uh, bad, what's good, what's interesting. So you, it gives you a table of all your targets down here and you click on it and it will display the target. Um, and this is an outdated um, um, uh, screenshot, but it shows you where the slit was. Um, it shows you uh, a 2D image of what the spectra looked like and the collapsed 1D spectra at the bottom. And so it's very useful, quick look uh, uh, visualization tool. Okay, so this is this kind of encompasses the, um, the the actual tools, but to help with the learning process, um, uh, SDSCI also provides um, uh, a bunch of Jupyter notebooks, and if we have uh, and basically they show you how to do a specific task. So, for example, uh, general stuff like loading. Uh, data, background estimation, um, uh, querying mast, so the archive, so that you don't have to literally download the data, you can download the data from your code. Um, so there's examples about that here. Um, and then specific notebooks on how, or Python notebooks on how to, uh, you know, do specific tasks, for example, PSF photometry. And if you click here, it will take you to the, to the, uh, uh, to the GitHub page, and there is installation um, helpers. So if you run this uh, bash script, it will install all of the Python packages that you need to, to actually run this code. Um, and the, the notebooks are there. And if you don't feel like downloading any of this, I'm just going to click on the repository link here. There's, a, a, there's another link here that has rendered notebooks. So uh, what would be an interesting one? Uh, let's look at exoplanets. So I talked a lot about galaxies, so let's look at planets. So it has text, uh, introduction, um, and then a step-by-step -step procedure on how to analyze near-spec um, uh, uh, near data uh, when it comes to uh, exoplanets, and it's uh, a lot of information and it's extensive. So it's uh, really here to support you, and for our uh, scientist um, uh, uh, audience here and uh, PhD students, if you want to uh, contribute these notebooks, um, uh, where uh, you know SDSCI is very uh, eager to find uh, contributors. So um, it, so please <laughs> contact uh, the JDAT team at SDSCI. Um, um, 
Okay, so this is a lot of information for today, but I just wanted to show you how to get to things. Um, and I will talk about specific things if people have questions about them. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, and um, I guess I'll pass it back to you. Wow, okay. So uh, if everyone wants to clap for our speakers, that was amazing. Um, two super, super interesting talks. See, there we go. We got the claps coming <laughs> through Zoom. Now, well done to both of you. This is such an exciting uh, experiment and such an exciting telescope and observatory. So um, I, I don't have uh, lots of questions in the chat yet. People want to see the people are greeting you from lots of places, from Ethiopia, from Ghana, from <laughs> um, and uh, and the feedback is very very positive here, and uh, uh, people would like your slides, <laughs> of course. And uh, there are no questions on the YouTube channel that is currently working. It's a different link, um, but I have a couple of questions for you. Maybe I'm I'm going to start with you, Robel. Um, my question is like you showed us all these incredible tools um, that are really that are already prepared to really enable scientists to work with the with the data, and the data will be public um, if not immediately at least within twelve months. So my question to you is, do you have a program to educate uh, potential users of this data in how to use those tools and things? And the reason I'm asking that is that. There are lots of places in uh, across Africa where there are people who are studying astronomy, but they don't necessarily have access to, you know, telescopes firsthand, but are able to do, um, you know, to do science, to do research, to teach themselves about astronomy using uh, public data repositories. But sometimes it's a bit hard to just read the docs and try to to get the get hold of, you know, get an understanding of it. So yeah, so. Are there any plans for, for education programs? So this is actually, I'm very glad you asked this question because this is uh, something that a lot of people are thinking about um, um, in general in AstroPy. So the AstroPy Learn um, uh, project is just, uh, you know, setting itself up. Um, and I think long-term that's kind of the plan is um, making um, enough learning and teaching materials that it becomes easier for uh, beginners to, to start without the need of like, uh, you know, some, some preparation because uh, you're right, it's kind of intimidating going into this um, uh, if, if, you know, you don't have any resources, any videos. Uh, from the SDSCI side, uh, there has been a couple of uh, webinars, they're called um, um, J webinars, if I remember them right, um, but they're basically um, um, webinars where, and I think they're recorded and uploaded on um, on YouTube, so you can uh, watch them. But basically, they're webinars where uh, uh, software engineers, uh, staff scientists discuss uh, specific instruments and you know tools. So that's also a good place to start. Uh, but yes, I uh, people are thinking about this, uh, and you know, hopefully, it becomes uh, uh, much more accessible. But uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, oh, that's wonderful. I've noted the J webinars. That would be also a very interesting uh, source of information. I have dropped. I just dropped the URL to the J webinars page in the chat. Um, that has a list of all of them, and there's links to all the materials. There was also before uh, before the call, before the call for proposals. Um, there was a series of like masterclass workshops. Um, that were taking place that both ESA and NASA supported. And um, that was really kind of uh, teaching people how to use the proposal tools. So if they wanted to propose to use web. Um, and so more, more than kind of like the pipeline and the back end um, tools when you have data. So that was really helping people get to, you know, proposing for time. Um, but a lot of them were actually uh, kind of, it, that was just going on just when COVID hit. So quite a few of them were have, had to sk be scaled back or uh, or canceled completely because of COVID and people couldn't travel. Um, but I, I, I haven't heard for sure if they're going to organize that for cycle two as well. But um, I do kind of hope that there will be something similar as well, yeah. Okay, thank you so much uh, for that. That's, that's really, really helpful. Um, we have a couple of questions in the in the chat. 
So uh, Nadia asks you, Sarah, if you can comment on what kinds of redshift James Webb Space Telescope will be able to confirm spectroscopically, and do you think we might break the current record around 11? Um, I mean, it's hard to, um, you know, it's hard to predict exactly what we will and won't uh, find. Uh, it's actually a really exciting thing is that often the biggest discoveries of an observatory are the ones that no one predicted. Um, but I think all of the, um, you know, people have done a lot of kind of simulations and modeling to to try and predict what we can, what we'll be able to do. And I do think that is within the, is expected to be within the range of, of Webb's capabilities, yes. Um, wow. Whether that will be in the first month or in the first two years, or you know that I, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, we were, and that is like really one of the big aims of the observatory is to really get spectroscopic redshift even for those very very distant galaxies. Wow, well, that's fantastic! Um, and uh, that brings another question: um, if something collides with the James Webb Space Telescope, what action will you take? Uh, if something collides, well, I mean, space is extremely empty. So um, the, 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 the risk of something big colliding with Webb is, I think is, is very, very, very small. Um, unfortunately, things in space move at very high velocity. So if something really big were to, you know, crash into the telescope, I think there's not a huge amount that we can do. <laughs> um, but I mean, the, the thing that, you know, there is stuff in space. A lot of a lot of the um, you know, there's a lot of things like dust particles and things like that. And so that is something that is really and you know we have a decent idea of how big little dust particles are and and how how much the the telescope will be hit by those. And that's really kind of included in the design. Um, so we know that we know over time there will be you know there'll be sort of like you know dust particles that cause you know tiny tiny bits of damage. But that's all basically kind of really calculated into the the risk um of, over the lifetime of the telescope um so and so that i think does not specifically require um any action because it's sort of expected um it's just really a matter of like also keeping track of uh, constantly keeping track of how the observatory is performing you know is there any degradation of filter transmissions or of the mirror you know the mirror reflectivity if the coatings are affected and things like that but in designing a space mission like this, in particular one that we know we can't service, like that we, we calculate in huge, huge safety margins to make sure that even in the worst case scenario, um, you know, we can, we, can, we can still fulfill the, the, the mission of, uh, of the project. Oh, that's exciting. And I think it brings a very natural question that's asked here is, what's the projected lifespan for the observatory? So the, the, the minimum requirement for the, the mission's lifetime was five years. And people are often like re, kind of say, oh my God, like that's nothing. But that is, you know, that was kind of the very minimum requirement. And um, so, so that's kind of what I was saying when people look at like absolute worst case scenario, you know, we would still have to meet that, that five years. The, for example, we already know, so the limit to the lifetime of the mission is uh, the availability of fuel so in Webb's orbit, we do need to make periodic adjustments to keep it in a stable orbit. And so the fuel, um, you know, it's, it's really like how long the fuel um, will, will last. Um, and so, uh, but we already know that we've been able to put a lot more fuel on board than, than kind of the, the minimum requirements. So we already know there that we have um, a lot more on, uh, on board to keep us going. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, so I mean, sorry, I lost my thread there for a second, but but basically, um, the I think like it'll be of order ten years. Like the exact number really depends on a lot of different factors, and particularly also with how well we can insert the telescope into that initial orbit will determine how much it has to be adjusted along um, over its lifetime. So it's little factors like that that will play into it. But um, it will pro the estimates right now are sort of of order ten years or possibly even more. Wow, that's amazing. So we have another question here. Is it sensible to say that JWST will help with the Hubble tension given how far it can probe? Um, 
Robel, do you have strong thoughts about that? I, I, it's not my my biggest area of expertise, but I think I can answer. I can say something about it. How about you? I I'm not sure actually, um, <laughs> because um, you know I, I know that uh, on one side of it you need surveys to look at um, uh, you know large scale structure and to to use the um, standard ruler, which is basically how how big. Um, a collection of galaxy is. Um, and on the other hand, you have uh, measurements from supernovae. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if there are proposals to do supernovae studies or large scale structure uh, surveys, uh, but just to plug uh, another telescope in this, uh, uh, the Roman Space Telescope is uh, specifically going to be aimed at large scale structure. So that will definitely help, but I'm not sure about JDVST. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Yeah. So the Hubble tension comes from from lots of different. There's lots of different parts to it, and every single one of the methods to determine the um, Hubble parameter uh, have their own kind of biases and difficulties and like model uncertainties. Um, and yeah, so a big a big part of the observations is really being able to do like really big large scale surveys. And Webb is not a it's not a big survey instrument, so it has a relatively small field of view. Um, so th that whole kind of large scale structure observations is, is more the realm of, of the Roman Space Telescope or on the European side, Euclid, which is also launching quite soon. Um, but what Webb will be able to do is, for example, I think there are programs in supernova, looking at supernovae, is really kind of, and because of its like sensitivity and very high spatial resolution, it'll be able to um, uh, address some of the uncertainties in like supernova physics and like understanding you know, understanding the properties of these supernova, be supernovae better, will in which will in turn then help us kind of reduce error bars on on these types of measurements uh, and put them in context for the Hubble tension. So I think there'll be there's lots of bits of the puzzle that Webb will be able to contribute to, yeah, but more from like a detailed physics aspect rather than looking at the large scale structure itself. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we have another few questions. One is, uh, will the James Webb uh, visualization tools, can they also be used for data from other instruments? For example, ground-based um, infrared telescopes. Right. I know, I think they have been tested with some other data sets. And, and I think the goal is to try and keep them as generic as possible, um, you know, like, Putting, you know, that's why they've also been uh, putting energy into developing AstroPy, which is more a generic astronomy Python library than something for web specifically. So I think that's a really that's been a good move. I think I've seen the um, the the CubeVis, which is the the IFU visualization tool. I think I've seen it used with data from like the Manga Survey, the you know the Sloan Sloan Digital Sky Survey IFU sur portion. So, um, but I, I, I can't say if it sort of like works perfectly for every IFU in the world, but I know that they have tested it with some other types of data. But they're also very open to input and feedback. So if there is, if you want to try it with your own data and, you know, it doesn't, something doesn't work, you, you're always welcome to like open an issue or contact someone about that. Excellent. Um, we have a question here from um, a teacher in geography in the making who wants to know um, how he can, how can be involved um, and he really likes uh, astronomy. So I guess this is really the question about opportunities for citizen science and for other types of involvement in the science of James Webb. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think there is, there are offices, uh, so NASA does have an office, I believe, uh, or, or STSCI has an office that do make educational materials, so that can be used in the classroom. I know, for example, actually, yeah, actually a really good source for that is um, the UK have a very good uh, web outreach office. Um, it's called Web Telescope UK, I believe, their website. I'll see if I can dig up the URL. And I think they have also produced a lot of classroom materials um, to learn more about web and also about like the surrounding technologies. Um, again, NASA have produced like some really nice video explainers about different aspects of the mission. Um, as for the actual kind of doing science with the data, um, to, more geared towards public or classroom, I think that will probably 
come a lot in the community. So there are a few, there are a number of very large observational programs called the early release science programs, which are kind of rather than have, you know, be a small group of people leading them, they are all kind of led by very, very large teams. And part of and they they got funding from the institute uh, to to do things like produce um, outreach materials, to produce community tools and things like that. Um, so those will probably be uh, <clears throat> those will probably be producing more kind of materials like that or citizen science projects and things like that. But I'm not 100 percent sure what that will be or on what timeline. Uh, but let me just dig up the web telescope UK. Oh, that's uh, that's really that's really cool. It's always great when uh, there's an opportunity for for schools and teachers and and citizens to be involved in in the real science. And uh, I had another question here. Um, how long uh, do communications take between the control room and the telescope, considering how far it is? Um, this is, I mean, unlike Hubble, this is already a telescope that cannot be serviced, so we can't send astronauts to go and fix it like we did with Hubble. Now, how can, how long does it take to just send signals? A bit more to the right, a bit more to the left. <laughs> can you talk for a minute while I Google this, Rebel? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> oh my God, that's a really good question. Um, so, I mean, I, I would, should know I this, but yeah. I would say uh, more than a second, just because this orbit is past the moon, right? And it takes about 1.3 seconds to communicate with the moon. Um, so it's definitely more than a second. So <laughs> that gives you a lower limit. <laughs> so it, it, there is quite a delay. Um, okay, great. And we know the, the sun is at eight light minutes away, but it's not that far, right? That, that's too far. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you also you don't you don't go direct. You know, you I, we don't because it's so far away. You don't communicate directly. Um, it goes through the deep space network, so there is some relay on Earth involved as well. So yeah, the communication goes via the deep space network, uh, which is a, a an array of you know of, of, of dishes all all around the world. Um, it's actually very interesting because I I had never really worked with stuff like that either, but. Um, and then, you know, throughout the day, you kind of hand over to a different dish, um, you know, depending on the positions of, of things uh, in the sky. Um, there's, there's one, for example, in Kenya, I believe. There's one in Australia. There is uh, one in Madrid. Um, yeah, and it's kind of like dotted all around the world. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not actually 100% sure what, what the, the time scale is. I mean, it's minutes, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's some minutes. Um, in the first, the first kind of month, month or two, I believe we have permanent contact, constant contact with the telescope. Um, basically, how that works is you kind of have to buy time on that deep space network, and it is very expensive to communicate with things in outer space. Um, and so, so initially, when we're doing all the uh, deployments and uh, aligning the primary mirror and things like that, then we 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 are in constant contact with the telescope, twenty four hours a day. But then that reduces to having sort of windows in the day where we communicate and you sort of up, you know, and then you get all the data back and you upload all the things you want it to do in the next few hours. Um, and then once we get through commissioning, that will reduce further to, you know, I think maybe like one or two contacts a day or something like that. But I'd, I'd have to check the details. OK, yeah, I guess that's also important for the for the download of the data and the, the observations from the telescope, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the telescope has some onboard storage, um, and then that as soon as as soon as we have contact, it downlinks everything. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have another question here: Is what is the dimensions of the imaging CCD, and how is it, how it is coded? Uh, cooled. Sorry, my eyes. <laughs> how it is cooled? Um, so we don't have any CCDs on board. CCDs are for uh, for visible light, and uh, so we have we only have infrared detectors on board. Um, they are uh, we have various sizes. So for Miri, they are um, one k by one k pixels in size, um, and each pixel is, I believe, twenty five microns. Um, so I don't know. You know, you'd have to do the calculation of what that is physical dimensions. Um, 
the 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 most detector real estate uh, on board is in NERCAM that has ten individual detector arrays on board, and each of those are two k by two k, um, I believe, or are they four k? I think they're two k. Um, but yeah, so there's ten of them uh, on board. So that and and the pixels we're, we're very fine pixels, so it has very fine sampling. So that is that where the, the, a lot of the detector real estate is. Um, yeah, how they're cool. They have their own kind of individual um, cooling systems and heater. They well, that, like heaters, so that also when they when they cool, that their cooling is very controlled. Um, I, I'm not sure of the details of the technology for that. But yeah, so we don't we don't have the kinds of huge detectors like like something like the LSST telescope, or the Rubin telescope, sorry, uh, on Earth would have, or or things like the Roman Space Telescope or Euclid, which have these absolutely enormous arrays uh, of detectors to be able to survey huge parts of the sky. That's not what Webb has. Yeah, that would also presumably cause problems in terms of amount of data to download. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay, oh, this is this is fantastic. We don't have any more questions in the in the chat. And I'm checking on YouTube and we also people say people say thank you and people are enthusiastic. They really we really, I think we all learned a lot from uh, from your talks um today. Um one last question for each of you is what does the future hold for you? You, you want to go first, Rebel? <laughs> Sure. So I, I'm uh, so I'm pursuing my PhD right now. So my hope is to be uh, able to study galaxies and galaxy evolution. Um, so I'm hoping to um, become a professor um, and you know hopefully uh, become a professor and teach or uh, um, you know go back to SDSCI like an institute like SDSCI and become a, a researcher. So that's kind of the dream. Uh, fingers crossed. Uh, but that's that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. We wish you all the best. Um, and yeah, for me, um, so for you know, I'm the next six months are going to be extremely busy with all the commissioning, um, and then after that, um, yeah, I'm I, I will be staying at the Space Telescope Science Institute for the foreseeable future. So I have a you know some programs on the telescope that I'm involved in myself. So I'm really looking forward to um, actually doing some research with the project I've worked on for so long. Um, and then, you know, I'm I, I'm a permanent position with the European Space Agency. And so in due course, it may, you know, I may go and work on a different different space missions. We have a whole portfolio of astronomy missions planned for the, for the next uh, decade. So um, I may stay here for a bit longer, and I, but I could also move to work on a different mission. I kind of have to see what what opportunities come up, but uh, definitely looking forward to doing uh, you know working with the data for a couple of years, um, some vacation time, which there hasn't been a huge amount of recently as well. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay, well, well, I hope uh, travel restrictions come down and you can come and visit us in South Africa, <laughs> yes, and please. especially in twenty twenty four. Remember. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, um, seeing that we have no more questions, I think it's uh, my turn to uh, give a massive, massive thank you to both of you for this super, super interesting interventions and presentations you gave today. So again, uh, clap, clap from everyone here. Um, it's, it's all a bit uh, funny on, on Zoom, but uh, I think I speak for everyone here when I say that we, we spent a really fascinating moment in your in your company. Um, I would like to thank the audience for coming and, uh, and taking part in this event. And of course, for AFAS, African Astronomical Society for organizing this event. And uh, please stay tuned because AFAS, as uh, Sarah was saying at the beginning, is going to organize these fairly regularly. So we look forward to having more of these events. And um, Please uh, remember, um, I'm going to save the chat because then we'll keep the links. Um, and uh, yeah, remember that the data for, and, and the software for James Webb uh, Space Telescope is open. 
and that all of you can take part in the in the science. Um, so yeah, tuned for more, and we look forward to speaking with you soon. And thank you so much, everyone, and happy birthday, Jamal. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye to everyone.